Hey everybody, this is Aubrey Chavez from Faith Matters. For artist J. Kirk Richards, painting has become a meditative practice. Over the last 20 years, he's created well over 2,000 works of art, many of them with religious themes. And he's particularly inspired, as many artists have been over the last 2,000 years, by Jesus. He's found that in creating images of Jesus in such a prolific way that he's been able to explore a huge variety of different and particular aspects found in the text about Jesus' life. And this exploration has been meaningful to many more than just Kirk. In recent years, he's become one of the most prominent Latter-day Saint artists alive today. In this conversation, Kurt talked about how he got his start by dropping out of school and jumping on a Greyhound bus, the promise that he made God if he found success as an artist, and how faith and creativity work hand in hand. Some of Kirk's work is truly fascinating and even provocative. Kirk shared with us more about his open-ended approach to his art and his intention to expand borders stylistically and culturally. Kirk lives and works at his studios in Utah and Massachusetts. He and his wife Amy have four children. And on a personal note, Kirk's work has been really inspiring to us for many years, and we're so excited and really grateful that Kirk found the time to come on and talk with us. If you'd like to find out more about Kirk and his work, you can head to jkirkrichards.com. And with that, we'll jump right into the conversation. Well, Kirk, thank you so much for joining us. It's an honor to have you here. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Um, I, we thought maybe we could get started just by having you tell us a little bit more about yourself, Part particularly when I meet someone that I consider to be uh, an incredible artist. I always wonder what their childhood looked like and if talent was manifesting itself very early. So maybe you could just like tell us a little bit about growing up and how that sort of, uh, you know, pertains to what what's become of your of your career and your life. Well, thanks for the compliment, first of all. Yeah. I grew up in the shadows of BYU in the Tree Street. So I was, uh, my grandma uh, was at, had actually bought that home because she taught voice at BYU. And then her her husband had been in the military, but uh, kind of towards the end of their career, they she moved to Provo and bought this house that um, my parents raised their family in. Eight kids. I was I'm fourth of eight kids, and then and then actually I I began raising my family with uh, there with Amy. We purchased the same house, so. But yeah, so when I was a kid, you know, I'd play in the sandbox and I'd hear the bell tower ringing mm -hmm. and, and we did music in our house. So before school, we had scripture study, you know, we would, we would always start with good intentions at the beginning of a semester and say, yeah, we're going to do a scripture study. And that would last, you know, for many weeks, but, um, but, uh, so the two things we did before school were scripture study and practice our instruments. So, okay. Um, my mom's a violin teacher. I grew up playing the French horn and the piano. Um, I didn't love what the French horn did in long rehearsals. You know, typically in an orche orchestra piece, the French horn would count many, many measures of rests and <laughs> then be expected to come in for a glorious two measure solo <laughs> yes, totally. on a cold lip and blurt something <laughs> horrible out and then <laughs> and then count more, many more measures of rest whereas in the band it was just typically you know the upbeats so anyway at the age of um about 13 i saw the movie dead poet society and I dramatically stormed uh, around the house or, you know, begged my parents to let me stop music lessons. I did not want to do this for my living and um, asked them to to let me refocus on visual arts. Oh, wow. I'd actually had uh, many of my music lessons were in the Fine Arts Center at, at BYU and I would see the the paintings and the prints and everything up on the wall and uh, the exhibitions there and i just thought man that's i i just i'm really feeling something about this and like maybe this is something that i could uh, you know that i want a piece of that mm. i uh, that i could do and so they said uh kirk you know keep going for another year with your music lessons and if you feel the same way we will find you uh, a visual arts teacher so a year later i was 14 and i'm like it's time. My time has come. <laughs> and they did, they, they found a, a teacher for me. So, and I began taking le uh, classes in public school as well. So it was mm. public school. And then I had, had a private teacher as well. 
and I just started turning my focus towards visual wow. arts. And prior to that, did you did you draw? You know, yeah, I did. I mean, I love drawing. The, some of my earliest memories. I mean, I I have some things even from primary. Like we made a little ring bound book showing the creation, which is kind of interesting. Really? Wow. Yeah, I didn't make that connection until now, but um, <laughs> that's so cool. Um, but also, I remember winning an award in the in the reflections contest which is the public school arts competition uh, oh. i drew some candy canes in a in a christmas stocking please I tell think, me you know where that is do you have it? i don't do you... <laughs> i don't think i've got it i kind of doubt it but i re just remember the theme was what makes me smile or something oh. like that. <laughs> and so it was i think it was christmas do you feel like I kid you not on my way here? I was listening to music and I was thinking about your um, two of your pieces, the creation of Eve and Breath of Life, and and this song came on and I could hear these French horns in the background and I realized that's actually the word that comes to mind when I'm thinking of the emotion that I feel when I see both of those paintings. Like it feels like the majesty of French horns, and so I can't believe oh, wow. like that's what like I, I just. It, it's still hard for me to describe it. There's so much power and this golden light and, and the sound of it is French horns. So I'm super, I had no idea that that's what you played growing up, but I'm also just so curious if you think that that musical foundation is is in your art. Like, did that influence yeah, the way you paint? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And towards the end of my music, my esteemed music career as a young person, <laughs> I took uh, a year of piano lessons from Steve Thomas, who, who teaches up at BYU Idaho now. And so a, a lot of the things remain with me from that that particular experience about about phrasing and um, and rhythm and things like that. Those things I think about all the time when I'm making a painting. How can I incorporate rhythm? How can I um, phrase this shape? You know, how can I, where's the peak of the form, you know, much like the, a musical phrase. So those types of things, I think there's a lot of crossover. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's also, you know, it's one thing to have some talent or, you know, take lessons, even study in college, but it's a, it seems to me at least to be an entirely other thing to actually turn it into a career where this is, this is what you do. I would imagine that there are a lot more aspiring full-time artists than there are, you know, actual full-time artists. So could you talk about how you transitioned into that and really turned this into this lifetime calling? Yeah, I mean, I, <clears throat> I, I, I got to college and I was, I was thinking about studying something more practical. So I took a lot of science prereqs that I didn't end up utilizing. Yeah. But I, I did take a figure drawing class that I absolutely loved. And I came home and I talked to my <laughs> folks about it and I, and and knelt down and prayed about it and kind of made a promise to God that if I could figure out how to um, make a living as an artist that I'd try to help others behind me. And so that's that's been a driving force for me um, and and kind of a, a bedrock or a foundation for my approach to making a career and wow. just kind of like my commitment and kind of confidence moving through it is, is kind of based on that, that, that moment and that experience. But I, mid college, uh, I kind of dropped out of the program, hopped on a Greyhound bus, went and studied with an artist, I had a brief apprenticeship with this artist, Patrick Devonis on the East coast. And then he convinced me to finish up. So I came back. Mm. BYU let me back in. <laughs> I, have, <laughs> I, I have to ask if there were parental feelings <laughs> going on when you hopped on the Greyhound bus. Um, I think, yeah, that's a really good question. I, I, I think they were kind of uh, excited for me to take a road less traveled but I'm sure there was some nervousness there yeah. as well. My dad's always been kind of a tough love sort of person, but I remember he handed me a few bucks on, on my oh. way to the Greyhound station because um, I know he's actually got a, a tender heart behind his tough love. Wow. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I studied on the East Coast for a little bit, came back, finished my degree here at BYU. I got a Bachelor's of Arts degree 
And then I just wanted to jump straight into a career. So I, Amy and I lived in a basement apartment. We just really tried to be as frugal as possible so that I could spend my time making art, improving my craft, building, um, building an audience. Uh, and, and so I think a lot of credit goes to her for what we grew up. Uh, let's see, what was the term? Delayed gratification mm -hmm. was the yeah. term that we were <laughs> taught. Yeah. And so, uh, so it gradually grew, um, and it was quite slow growth for a while. And I, I actually thought we were doing pretty well, but um, I had grown up with as a in a home with meager means, <laughs> so so Amy had a little bit uh, higher expectations, and and we worked <laughs> together to achieve those. And wow, yeah. so you know things started really picking up seven, eight, nine years after we we started. I'm just curious if looking back, do you feel like your work has evolved, like your your style or what you're what you're most interested in? How have you changed? from that person trying to make it work in a basement apartment? Yeah, I've been always kind of stylistically spread. I've, I've always tried to push the boundaries out of, you know, outward so that I'm not kind of backed into a style, mm -hmm. a stylistic corner. So a lot of people will see something that I do and they'll say, wow, your style has really changed from when you started. But the truth is right from the beginning, I tried to work both more abstractly and more traditionally. And, and, and both of those threads have kind of carried forward to the present day. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you, you couldn't really say that I moved more abstract or that I moved more traditional over time. But I think there are a couple things that have changed. One is I do, a, I paint a lot more directly now than I did when I first started. So when I first started, I did a lot of layers you know, glazes, layers of translucent color built up. But now I, I paint a lot more directly. So I just try to mix the exact color I want and stick mm. it right on there from the beginning. Mm. So that's one thing. And then another thing is I have a lot more help today. So, <laughs> so my process has changed to involve a lot of studio assistants that help me get more work done and um often they are they are enlarging th smaller sketches that i begin with into you know full size canvases mm. i i'd love to know if you feel like this really is a calling because i i feel like for us your work feels important it feels like someone was called to create this because of of what it's creating for us but i'm just curious as the artist if you felt that or if it's just creativity that has to come out and so it does was there a moment where you really felt like this is something you're meant to do yeah i have always felt called to do this i mm -hmm. mean from from the moment that i you know that day that i came home from class and mm -hmm. made that promise from then on i remember even just during my mission i was I didn't do hardly any art on my mission. Mm -hmm. I did a couple pencil drawings of, for some of the uh, other elders' girlfriends, and they were promptly <laughs> jerjawned once I finished the drawings. So that I just—that's not a good, not a good idea. Sorry, these were drawings of. They just handed me a photo of their their girlfriend, and then and they sent it to them as a gift. Well, I don't know what okay. they did with it. Okay, them. I don't know if they were dear John first. Or okay, or got after, it. But. But I just didn't do a lot of art during my mission, but I did feel called. And part of that was part of that feeling, I think, was reinforced by my mission call itself, which was to Rome, Italy. And so I got to see yeah. all these great works of art by, you know, Caravaggio, Michelangelo. And yeah, and, and I just felt like, you know, God was aware of my of me and what I wanted to do with my life. Uh, Aubrey mentioned Breath of Life. Uh, which is has actually been a favorite of ours for a long time. We first saw it in the BYU Muse Museum of Art. It had a very, I remember, it had a very prominent uh, placement right when you sort of enter that that exhibit. Yeah, it that was, was it was right there, and that was maybe one of the first pieces of art that I felt the need to just stand in front of for you know minutes, you know, as opposed to sort of glancing and and walking by. And it honestly, it felt like seeing that for me, it was a spiritual it was it was a spiritual experience that I remember to this day, and. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious if you, well, there's a sort of broader question here, which is how your your faith influences your 
art, but maybe more directly, is, is this process of creation continuously a spiritual experience for you? Yeah, I think y yes, and, and maybe not not in the way that you might be thinking. I don't necessarily um, feel like I see God every time mm -hmm. I go into the studio. Yeah, <laughs> but I do. I do think of the process of creation as a type and a shadow of of the faith experience like for me it's like what is the next step and i i can only see down the road you know maybe two or three steps but i just take that that next step and so and so making something reminds me of this earthly experience of just like we just got to do do things on faith take one more step but i do really love um I, like i have spiritual experiences in art museums and so i think about a lot about like what is it about this particular work that i'm standing in front of that is so moving to me and how can i capture some of that that spiritual experience in my own work so mm -hmm. Yeah. When you, I'm curious, um, when you're starting a new project, are you starting from that emotional place? Like this, I want to, I want to capture the, this feeling and you're searching for images that give you that feeling, or are you articulating a particular doctrine and, and then trying to incorporate some sort of emotion? Like, I, I'm just curious if you have an emotion that you want us to feel, you know, when we're looking at a particular piece. Yeah, definitely. By the time it's done, I don't necessarily begin it just depends on the piece. Mm. Sometimes it's just about like, I got to get in the studio and make something. Wow. You know, and, and I'll just start with my brush, like drawing a, a person. And then I'm like, what is this person doing? Like, what is this gesture? What story is this gesture <clears throat> telling? And then I, and then the m meaning kind of builds and oh, then wow. the feeling builds. And then I just have to kind of make them gel as I, kind of bring it home right like yeah. it or you know i might begin something much more deliberately and say i i want to capture the feeling of this scriptural phrase or whatever and or or a specific feeling that i feel like like one of my earliest paintings was uh cherubim and a flaming sword and i i just loved that kind of the beauty and the magic of that that idea mm -hmm. and i did not um necessarily want to capture maybe you know like a, a dog a dogmatic mm -hmm. um approach to it yeah but there was a there was a feeling that i wanted to and, and so i made decisions about that i made the angels women i made this sword glow uh, there's kind of their hair is flowing yeah and so those are all uh, aesthetic decisions that reinforce the feeling that i was trying yeah. to convey from my perspective looking at some of your pieces um you know you do you push some boundaries maybe in some cases as it pertains to latter-day saint orthodoxy and or maybe you wouldn't even agree with that assessment but that's that's been my perception and i guess I would I would love for you to describe your faith a little bit if if you're willing to do so. I I have a feeling that it's interesting, um, and maybe <laughs> and maybe a little bit different. Um, you use the word you use the word dogma in your last answer, and that kind of like triggered this question for me a little bit. Like I don't see you necessarily as having a a dogmatic faith, but at the same time, um, religious themes are so prominent, and and in some cases literal in your artwork. Um, so I really resist some of the limits that kind of are placed around God. And I think that, that that's really one of the functions that art can have is to, to reopen or open new possibilities in terms of our understanding, um, 
and and so that's one of the things that I try to do with my own art. And so I'm just like I don't like to be back. I try to push outward from a stylistic corner. I try to push outward from a dogmatic corner mm. and hopefully gently enough that I can open yeah. open up those possibilities for people around me. Yeah. I would love to hear if anything comes to mind, like any specific pieces come to mind where you feel like you've been able to do that. Oh, <laughs> I mean, um, right from the beginning, like I was saying that cherubim and a flaming sword, yeah, if yeah. my understanding of traditional uh, LDS doctrine is correct, you know, those would probably have needed to be male angels, mm -hmm. right? So that was my first year out of college that I was doing wow. that kind of thing. Right. And so the idea of expanding the borders, enlarging the tent, hopefully people take it um, with the goodwill that I intend to make these paintings with and um, consider that the greatest of all of gospel principles is charity. Yeah. You know, everything else the scriptures tell us will fail, but charity will never fail. Yeah. A lot of your, a lot of your work um, involves Jesus as a subject. Why, why has he been an inspiring subject for you? Yeah, I love, well, I, I, for many reasons, and I'm just trying to, to list them in my brain, but yeah. <laughs> well, probably one of the first reasons was I loved the imagery. Like I remember going to church houses and, and the temples when I was a young man and seeing the Karl Bloch images, and I loved that, the spirit of those images. And then I would go, you know, I served my mission in Italy and I saw the Michelangelo's and the Caravaggio's, these Renaissance Christian pieces that also just like, I love that feeling. And so I, I think that spirit of Jesus kind of permeated that artwork and continues to. And so part of it is just like my response to those things, those images, that, the images that I respond to are often about Jesus. Mm -hmm. And um, and and that's also led me then to devote a lifetime of trying to create those images, which has led me to just kind of meditating on like who is Jesus, who was Jesus, and what does that mean for me in my life? And, um, you know, I've, to be honest, I think about, who Jesus is without the Book of Mormon. I think about who Jesus is in the Book of Mormon. I think about who Jesus is based on like just our historical writings and and trying to separate out like what aspect of Jesus is being transmitted through these different texts yeah. and and how am I going to relate to those? I love that. And one of our favorite pieces, and maybe this is why it's the favorite of so many, is the Jesus said, love everyone, which is the rainbow Jesus. And he's sort of got his head tipped and seems to be embracing his own robe, which is full of silhouettes of people in these rainbow stripes. Um, and I think for us, it was powerful because it, it, I feel like you instantly you you instantly understand this is Jesus. These people love Jesus and all the things that you mentioned that Jesus represents and and there's inclusivity here. And those things are sometimes intention and it just feels like this instant way to understand that we're trying so hard to embrace both things completely. And I think that's really hard to articulate in a and and someone walking through your house can see that image and it's like you've had a conversation. But I would love for you to just talk about that piece in particular, because I think I feel like that's maybe the one that I see most often out and about. And I just wonder if there's anything that you want to make sure that people know about that painting that maybe we miss by just, you know, the cursory walk bys. Well, I think you described it succinctly and very well. And, um, you know, one of the hardest things for me in in my faith journey and kind of retaining my faith and continuing to participate in a commu this community that I grew up in and was formative for me has been, and I think I see this in other traditions as well, but just the this new understanding 
of our LGBTQIA um, loved ones and, and, and acquaintances, like our understanding of their experience has dramatically changed in the last decade. And, and so it's very, you know, for me personally, how do I continue to be a Christian with that new understanding? How do I continue to, um, work and love and, uh, serve in this community and hopefully grow together. And, and sometimes that growth is just immensely painful. That's been our experience. It just feels like a little pin in this experience that we're having. And it's a symbol that that's going on for us. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I think like I had, I had a friend just text me yesterday and that her husband had been a bishop and had put that image up in his office and, oh. and then left, you know, that, that, and then was released ultimately after the he'd served well and then a new bishop came but left that image up in the office and just said you know the, that image has done more for his uh because it, particularly because it's a a, you, uh, a single adult or you know like a young ward young people that the that image has really made a big difference and wow. so that's you know that kind of to hear that kind of experience makes me just feel like that there is uh, that art make does make a difference, and yeah. and that that calling that I've felt um, maybe is not as futile as it's yeah. some days it seems. You know, yeah. it's definitely not. Yeah. I do you ever find yourself? either struggling to create something or avoiding it altogether because of fear of controversy or, or pushback? Oh, that's a good question. I I have had a some pushback, you know, I had a a whole experience where the world felt like it was descending on me and yeah. Um and, and in the end it was a it was a really good experience for me. Like I I think it taught me to approach it with humility and just to turn the other cheek. Like I, if we could turn the other cheek more and learn and stop getting defensive individually and also institutionally, I think that would work wonders, work wonders for us. And I think that's really what Jesus was getting at when he talked about turning the other cheek and he talked about um, giving your cloak, uh, and going the extra mile. It's, it's the opposite of getting defensive. And I haven't, you know, that's something that I ha had to learn and, and continue to learn, but it was also really freeing because, um, I felt like there, f some of the expectations that might, I might have been carrying on my back were released. I just, I, I do believe in the freedom of, of, of truth and of just like dropping your burden. Yeah. Um, and, and maybe, maybe that day will come again for me soon. I don't know. Wow. Do you feel like you're painting, um, ideas that are exploratory that maybe you haven't totally got a solid opinion on yet and you're just imagining you know, what something could look like if it was really different and maybe you change your mind or, or are you trying to paint something that feels deeply true? I, I always like to think that I'm exploring. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I always like to maintain some room to explore aesthetically, thematically. And one of my problems today is that some of the explorations are projects that take years mm -hmm. and years to complete. And so so to keep exploration fresh means I'd always be starting <laughs> things and never finishing things. Okay. But, but I, there is an element to that as well. Like I am always start, starting yeah. things. Um, but yeah, I, I think exploration is so imp important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Richard Bushman told us when we spoke with him a few months ago that he believes that art is the next frontier for the church. 
Um, and if I remember correctly, he feels like we're kind of, we've got a very solid foundation academically and yet maybe some, at least in, institutionally in the church, um, some further room for growth in, in art. Do you, and I know you've been intimately involved with the Center, Center for Latter-day Saint Arts. And I'm just curious, do, do you see it? Do you see it that way? And oh, you know, we could have like a seven <laughs> episode series on, on that question right there. I think if it's a frontier, we've got two options, in my opinion. We're either exploring uncharted territories and we don't know where we will end up, or we think we know where we're going and we're going there to colonize. So in my opinion, the former is the much better option. We're such a young church, but do you feel like art has played that role, <clears throat> you know, being open and exploratory in in our church culture yet? Or do you think this is kind of something that we're trying to grow into? I think it, it has. And there have been fascinating people doing fascinating things in, in you know, Latter-day Saints for many years. So, so I guess, again, it comes back to like, what are we trying to accomplish? Are we yeah. trying to, is this... A, a method for us to understand ourselves, which is a, a good goal in and of itself. I think a lot of people want the validation of the outside world. And I think that th that's justified in things Jesus taught, like being a light uh, on a hill or um, being the salt of the earth. Like those are things that can be accomplished. But, <laughs> but there's a disconnect between um, I think I, it was Chris Rock or, or somebody on one of the shows that was saying, y "You've got, uh, you've got the, you've got to have a regional success before you can tr transition mm. into a more, uh, uh, you know, global or national um, scene." And and right now we've got a ladder, a regional ladder that's completely disconnected yeah. from the latter that it takes to a larger audience. And so I think it's it's worth exploring how we might be able to bring those ladders together to connect in order to frankly be salt yeah. uh, to the to the food, which is the world, right? Like yeah. the, you don't know, just drink a cup full of salt. Yeah. <laughs> right. what, where, what about with um with official church artwork. So the stuff that it hangs in meeting houses or temples or appears in lesson manuals or on websites or, or whatever, like where, what, what, what's like a compelling vision for where that could go? I don't think it's probably the right call to just say that it's op open exploration in that arena because there, I, I think there are needful boundaries that a church institution has. Sure. Um, but what, what do you think? Where, where can we go? Well, that? for example, the museum is trying to hold shows that are celebrating diversity and trying to introduce new images to church membership and church leadership from around the world. And so, um, so I would love, of course, to see the, what the museum is doing take hold and the people at the museum are just doing wonderful things to make that happen. Um, and, and the more the church becomes global, you know, the more this will happen. I think it's an in inevitability. Yeah. And when okay. you say the museum, just to be clear, you're talking about the... It's the museum. I think at one point it was called the Museum of Church History and Art, but oh, now okay. it's yeah, just yeah. called the Ch Museum of History. Yeah. And also has a lot of art in it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense to me that art that, that this is a really important role that art can play because when you start seeing those images <clears throat> of of a more diverse looking Jesus, I think you just it's not even conscious. It just starts to feel more normal and and so I can see how how art can play a really powerful um, role in maybe being the frontier. But art can do things that don't. It doesn't have to be articulated. It's just like something that becomes a little bit more normal, and then we're able to start talking about it without quite so much fear, you know. And, yeah, and I think one thing that member membership can do is to start replacing some of those images in their home. Yeah, that's, I I love that suggestion. Um, I'm super curious. Did you have something to follow no, up? No, go there? ahead. Just and this is a little bit change of subject, but I don't know if you've seen all the hubbub in the last year or so about generative artificial intelligence yeah. and the things that it can do. 
um, both in terms, and this is happening across uh, a variety of fields now, both in language and in in visual art and in music and in video. Um, how do you, but as it comes to, as it pertains to like these uh, Dolly 2 and Stable Diffusion that are these image generators, do you see that as a threat to real art, to real artists, or could it go somewhere good in some way? Or should we just push this to the side and let artists do their work, I guess? I, I see it as a new technology that is similar to other technologies of the past. Like when the camera was invented, you know, I think portrait artists were like, our world is, is over, you know? And when, uh, when computer generated prints, well, let's say offset lithography, for example, you know, I think print, traditional printmakers um, thought, well, what's our role going to be in the future? So definitely it will have a major effect and more so on certain artists than others. I think there will always be an interest in handmade goods, even when we reach the day where a computer can generate an image and do a 3d printed surface color with paint or whatever yeah. as a, you know to look like it is handmade i still think that humans are humans and humans want things from other humans um these things come and go and there will always be a need for artists i really do think it's in many ways democratizing imagery i see lots of social media posts that are relying on AI generated images. And in the past, what could that person do? They would have to track down a bunch of related images. They would have to get permission. And so I think that it's really great that anybody can enter prompts and come up with imagery to tell the story that they want to, that they want to tell. I mean, think about m music and file sharing that totally <laughs> uh, ruined the way that art, that musicians made a living for, for mm -hmm. decades. And they've just had to figure out new ways of doing that. But it also, uh, uh, you know, opened up a new world. Like, you know, you used to have to be, um, uh, as an independent musician, you know, my brother-in-law, David Tolk, he would go to, um, um shop and bring a stack of cds and play his keyboard and you know m you might sell 20 cds or something whereas today you know his he's had a huge hit on pandora that gives him income every month and and millions of uh of listens and so so many people are able to access art in ways that they were prohibited from mm -hmm doing in the past and i think ai will feed into that um but we just don't know how yet yeah, yeah that makes so much sense well thank you so yeah, much same. what what can we expect from you in this coming year yeah this year we i'm doing solo exhibits that i have planned and in august i'll be doing a show in provo at writ and vision um that's my plan and then we are, I'm trying to move towards opening a very small museum that hopefully we'll be able to grow. But um, I'm not exactly sure when that will open. It might be later this year. It might be next year. Wow. wow. So much to look so cool. forward to. Yeah. yeah, that's great. Thank you so much for Thank your you, work. Yeah, it's my been pleasure. It's been awesome. Yeah. It's been, been a pleasure for me. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much for listening. And a big thanks to Kirk for coming on the show. If Faith Matters content is resonating with you and you get the chance, we would love for you to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you listen on. We read all of the reviews and it really does help us to get the word out about Faith Matters and we appreciate the support. Thanks again for listening and remember you can check out more at faithmatters.org.